Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. I've been trying to avoid Genesis apologetics, but like a lingering cough, they just won't go away. This time just some movie guy sent me their video, and this one's a bit more in-depth than their usual drivel, so I'll give it a go. It's about how dinosaurs fit into the Bible, and it ends up fitting just as neatly as that square peg in a round hole, so let's take a look. Evolution holds that dinosaurs evolved 220 million years ago and died about 65 million years ago from any of a number of possible extinction events. Yeah, that's close. I mean, it's it's usually more of a blend of different causes leading to a mass extinction event. Usually it's an asteroid impact as the main cause, combined with a rise in volcanic activity causing drastic climate change, which made it harder for larger animals to survive. Ultimately, though, for this video, the, the cause doesn't actually matter. All that matters is that we know that the non-avian dinosaurs existed, and that no trace of them has been found later than 65 million years ago. Also, I'd like to point out that in your list of causes, the Alvarez hypothesis is the idea that an asteroid hitting the Earth was the main cause of the extinction event, which sounds an awful lot like an extraterrestrial impact. In fact, upon looking up extraterrestrial impact theory, I found that Walter and Luis Alvarez, for whom the Alvarez hypothesis is named, were the same people cited for the extraterrestrial impact theory. You wouldn't happen to be padding your infographic a bit with the hope of encouraging people to think there isn't scientific consensus on the matter, would you? I know creationists would never be dishonest in their presentations, right? But the Bible teaches that all land animals, including dinosaurs, were created on the sixth day of creation, just thousands of years ago, and they were all named by Adam just before God handed over his completed creation to Adam and Eve. Right there, right there, that. If you don't see how ridiculous it is to take Genesis literally from that, I honestly don't know what to say. How long do you think it took Adam to name every creature? How creative was the guy? I mean, there are about eight and a half million species on the planet that we know of today, and there are an estimated five billion species that have gone extinct. Now let's ignore the extinct ones for now, even though you're suggesting that he would have had to name those too, and let's also cut the estimated number of species in half just to be generous. That means if he was able to come up with a new name every minute, he would have had to be naming things for four million minutes or just over seven and a half years if he went straight without sleeping, just under an 11 and a half years if he slept for 8 hours a day, and did nothing else except name animals all day long, every day. If that isn't completely ridiculous to you, then no wonder you can accept things like Noah's Ark and talking snakes. Charging them to take dominion over his completed creation. Then, about 4,300 years ago, the entire world was deluged by Noah's flood, and the dinosaurs, along with billions of other creatures, were wiped out. Let's take a quick look at some evidences that show that the biblical account might actually be true. Okay, so you said billions there with a B, so I'm going to have to redo my math. If Adam named one billion species, he would have had to name one species per minute for 1,902 years straight, without any sleep, to get through them all. That's almost a thousand years longer than Adam is said to have lived, and all this took place before God even thought to create Eve. And all that aside, why are there only 80 dinosaur kinds on the ark? Why not any of the other ones? And why do you have kinds in quotation marks? I mean, I know you're probably going for the signaling unusual usage meaning of quotation marks to show that you realize that you're not using the word in its current commonly accepted sense, but most of us will look at that as calling our attention to the fact that its use here is dubious. First, dinosaurs are cleverly designed. Consider this Triceratops. Its 2,000 pound head is mounted in a way that allows it to turn every which way, yet still be strong enough to ram something, even while running. So, Triceratops evolved a cool head, therefore the Bible is true? I don't follow. What about massive seropods with weight-bearing systems from hip to toe that allow its 200,000 pound body to even walk, and neck vertebrae that are 90% filled with air so it can lift up its head? Yeah, seropods. You mean sauropods, right? And uh, again, evolving a cool mechanism to be a cool dinosaur proves the Bible? I still don't follow. Next, there's the absence of dinosaur ancestors and transitions. Even the Chicago Field Museum sign admits there have been zero transitions between dinosaur kinds. Okay, you're wrong on that point, but let's ignore that for the moment and just take what you said at face value. So what? 
We have hundreds of transitional fossils between other animals. It is perfectly understandable that we would be missing a lot of creatures from 65 to 230 million years ago. That's a long time. Now, evolution happens and is well documented, so having an ancient line of animals where we haven't found the exact transitions isn't exactly an airtight case against evolution. Fossilization is such a rare event that it is to be expected that we can't find all the animals in an ancestral line. Let me put it this way for you. Not having every single last scrap of information about every animal that ever was on the tree of life does not invalidate the information that we do have. It shows question marks regarding where they came from. It's almost like someone just put each basic kind on Earth right at the same time. Except that each basic kind, at the same time, spans a period of about 170 million years. If they were all created at the same time, then how come we never found a single dinosaur from the Triassic period in the same layer as a dinosaur from the Cretaceous period? Why are they always separated by dinosaurs found in the Jurassic period, without exception? And why are no Jurassic dinosaurs found in the same layers as Triassic and Cretaceous? It's almost as if they evolved slowly over millions of years. There are even dinosaur design features that show they lived in the ideal pre-flood world. Sauropods can exceed 200,000 pounds, yet they have tiny nostrils for breathing. Pterodactyls may have been too heavy to fly in today's atmosphere. Same with huge pre-flood dragonflies. It is well documented that in the Paleozoic era, Earth's atmosphere contained approximately 50% more oxygen than it does today, and this is what allowed for these massive dragonfly-like bugs. The Apatosaurus, on the other hand, lived in the late Jurassic period, and uh, the way it coped is it, it's thought that it had an avian-style respiratory system which would allow for it to breathe with its long neck and huge mass. Now, there is some debate about this, but really, it doesn't matter. Clearly, the animal existed, and according to all the evidence, it existed in the late Jurassic, 145 to 164 million years ago. The giant dragonfly, according to all the evidence, existed in the Paleozoic era, which ended about 252 million years ago. Ago. Meaning, assuming the latest possible date for the dragonfly and the earliest possible date for the Apatosaurus, they lived 107 million years apart. You're saying that a lack of understanding of the Apatosaurus respiratory system is enough to throw out all of the other evidence demonstrating how far from each other and how far from us these two creatures lived? That's ridiculous. The fossil record is filled with giant creatures and plants. We know this because there are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the Earth. Now, where have I heard that before? If there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the Earth, and that's what you find. If there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the Earth. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the Earth. Why is it that all creationist arguments seem to lead right back to answers in Genesis? And when we look at the dinosaur fossil record, we see that they were buried furiously, rapidly, and simultaneously, oftentimes found fleeing in groups. Hmm, I wonder if that might have anything at all to do with the fact that a relatively quick burial in sediment is one of the prerequisites for becoming a fossil in the first place. You know, that's kind of like wondering why everyone accepted into Harvard had high grades and then claiming it must be that all applicants to Harvard must have had high grades because everyone accepted in has them. Floods happen, and it doesn't have to be a global flood to result in herds of animals running away from it and for other animals to be buried in unrelated flood deposits. Creationists have this tendency to see the word flood and jump on it as if the only possible explanation is a worldwide flood. It wouldn't surprise me at all if their next move was to use videos from the flood in Houston and show it as evidence for Noah's flood. See, there was a flood. How else could you possibly explain it? Take this massive bone bed in Hilda, Canada. Thousands of centrosaurs were catastrophically buried over an entire square mile. Oh, there was a flood in Alberta, therefore the whole world flooded. Now what you left out there was the critical part for that particular bone bed is that most of the bones were chewed on by scavengers in between the animal's death and burial. They were likely buried by a second flood in the same area, an area which at that time period would have been prone to tropical storm activity. Or this one in China, where thousands of different kinds of dinosaurs were simultaneously buried in a single 980-foot-long ravine. 
I couldn't find very much information about that particular location, mostly just news articles. But that being said, I didn't even see anything in the news saying that they had all gathered there to die at the same time. In fact, what I did find was that most of the fossils are from the late Cretaceous period, meaning that some of the fossils were not from that period. Now that gives it a date range of at least 45 million years. I didn't find any source that claimed they had all gathered there to die at the same time, not even the AIG website that claimed that, though of course it did have the obligatory reference to a large flood. The quote that you're showing in the video can be found on four websites. The first being the MCM Group, the company which was contracted to design an exhibit around the Zhu Cheng site, um, and they cited no sources. The second was from studyinchina.org, and was a blurb on their site trying to attract people to school in China. It also provided no sources. The third and fourth were both blog posts that were both links to a dead page on rebelmouse.com. So until someone tells me who these researchers are who say this, I'm going to go with the still poorly sourced but tiny bit more reliable articles that claim that they came from a time period spanning millions of years and as such are in agreement with how paleontology works in the rest of the world as well. There are hundreds of dinosaur bone beds all over the world, including the U.S. where the Morrison Formation covers 13 states and 700,000 square miles. Thousands of torn apart dinosaurs are buried here in hundreds of mass graves, with many found in the classic death pose with their necks arched back, choking as they died. So what's your point? Dino bones are often found in the death pose, therefore the Bible is true? Where does it cover the dinosaur death pose in the Bible? Maybe if that were in there somewhere, it would have a bit more credibility. Museum signs everywhere even admit they died in a watery catastrophe. And the only possible watery catastrophe in human history is a global flood. Local floods are just so rare they can be dismissed, right? Um, tell that to the people in Houston. And again, I'm sure this has nothing to do with the fact that the corpse needs to be buried before it decomposes too far in order for it to fossilize, and floods often bring with them sediment that would accomplish this. Some dinosaurs are even found mummified, with tree leaves, flowers, ferns, shrubs, and algae still in their stomach. Now that particular specimen that you're showing was a duck-billed dinosaur found in 1999. There are better examples of this so-called mummification, like this notosaur which can be seen in the Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta. But uh, one fact remains. All the organic matter, including the plant matter left in its stomach, has been fossilized. That is, it has been replaced with minerals. These mummified specimens are incredibly rare, but the only thing that sets them apart from normal fossils is the fact that they are so well preserved. Dinosaurs are even found buried with marine creatures. Isn't a global flood the best explanation for this? No, 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 no. Not even close. Now, I'm having a bit of trouble locating any information on it outside of the creationist circles, but one thing I did notice is that the creationist sites never mentioned if the marine fossils were found in the same layer as the land dino fossils. There are several places in the world that are dry land now that used to be seas and oceans, and vice versa, uh, but the landscape has changed over time. This is well known and well documented, so a better explanation than an impossible flood would be that the land creatures lived there when it was dry land, and the sea creatures lived there when it was a sea. If they were found in the same layer, then I'm sure that would be interesting enough to make headlines somewhere outside of creationist circles, but even if that were to be the case, localized flooding still makes a hell of a lot more sense than global flooding. Scientists have been discovering soft tissue in dinosaur bones. They describe blood cells, blood vessels, connective tissue, and even collagen, which has a maximum shelf life of about 900,000 years at 40 degrees. Ugh, soft tissues again? Really? Now, I notice that once again you neglect to mention that the collagen they found was almost identical to ostrich collagen, which definitely supports the idea that modern birds evolved from dinosaurs. You also forgot to mention that we've known how iron plays a role in preserving the soft tissue since at least 2013. With a maximum shelf life of less than 1 million years, what's collagen doing in dinosaur bones that are supposedly 65 million years old? Many dinosaur bones are even found unfossilized in places like Madagascar, Alaska, and Montana. I would really like to see your sources for that. And the only ones I could find were, surprise, surprise, on creationist websites. So I'm checking the sources on the creation wiki. Most of the information on the page is either about dinosaur soft tissue, which I've already dealt with, or carbon-14 dating, which is the wrong method for dating dinosaur bones, as it is only accurate when dating samples of about 50,000 years old at the most. They even link to a video in which a creationist radio host calls a paleontologist, Jack Horner specifically, requesting that he carbon date some of the T-Rex soft tissue. 
Horner's response was to inform him that carbon dating doesn't work on samples that old, to which the radio host replied that he understands that. Carbon-14 doesn't Isn't work on something that old. I, I understand that. And the radio host even explained himself that C-14 is useless on samples over 50,000 years. Do you know how carbon-14 works? Yeah, I'm familiar, and I realize it's useless for anything over maybe 50,000 years or so. So they know that C-14 dating is inaccurate in older samples, but they persist in using it to date them. Now, I've seen Jack Horner talk, and he is usually a lot more eloquent than he is on the phone call. So clearly the guy caught him off guard, but he still does a decent job of explaining why it would be a useless procedure. So back to the unfossilized dinosaur bones. The only source that they have on the creation wiki page that is titled unfossilized dinosaur bones that even mentions unfossilized dinosaur bones is a link to a post on a creationist site called earthage.org the only sentence that addresses fossilization is at the very bottom where it quotes from a paper from 1987 stating that the bones are stained a dark red to brown but otherwise display little permineralization crushing or distortion their claim here is that because it wasn't completely permineralized it also wasn't fossilized except that permineralization is only one form of fossilization and nothing is said in the paper about what other forms of fossilization were present or if the non-permineralized parts of the sample were even preserved. Basically, the whole article just states that they found it and it may be the furthest north a dinosaur has ever been discovered at that time. Anyways, that's it for this video. Remember to follow me on Twitter, and this time, instead of asking you for your support on Patreon, I would suggest that you donate anything that you can to a disaster relief charity. I'll link a card to the All Hands Volunteers donate page. They have a four-star rating from Charity Navigator, and they are working in the Virgin Islands, which look like they need help more than anyone else at the moment. Um, but I'll also leave some additional links in the description below. And also, I will be donating all of my patron pledges from this video to All Hands myself. So, uh... Please donate, and I'll see you next time.